Rajan takes it. India win. He'll come back for the second. India have won the test match. India have won the series. They're going to get back for two. India at home. Lords goes wild. Welcome to another World Cup special episode on 81 All Out Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the uh, India-Australia rivalry uh, in World Cup. It's an interesting rivalry to start with because uh, when we thought of the idea, we thought of all those iconic matches. But looking at the record, it's a fairly uh, one-sided record with Australia thumping India on most occasions. 8-3, there's no way to argue that it's uh, an even Stevens rivalry. Uh, But uh, when Australia started dominating, most of the matches ended up uh, being fairly important matches in the context of those World Cups. So all in all, it's a, it's a rivalry that's resonated over the years, at least for the fans. Uh, they, they talk about uh, the 87 match or the 92 match, or even the 96 match, which is a, which is a fairly uh, contextless match considering the format that we had for the World Cup, but it still resonates for a lot of the fans. So uh, we wanted to explore this rivalry with uh, with a couple of uh, fans of, of both the teams. In fact, it's, it's unfair to call them uh, Indian cricket fans. We have our expert Vijay Armugam from Sydney. Hi, Vijay. Hello, Mahesh. How are you? I'm doing fine, man. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. And we also have a new member uh, in our podcast today, Aftab Kanna, from, again from Sydney, although he's not he's not there for a long time. He's originally from Delhi and he's been uh, shuttling between the US and Sydney, watching cricket in crazy time zones. Welcome, Aftab. Thanks, Mahesh. Thanks for having me here. Hi, Vijay. Good to meet you here as well. Let's uh, let's get going. As I was uh, trying to make sense of this rivalry, my memory seems to just remember all the big moments, even in, in fairly uh, one-sided thumpings like the 2003 World Cup. Uh, the fact that Ricky Ponting put on a performance like that makes that match an extraordinary match in, for posterity value as such. So how do you guys see this rivalry? Uh, maybe Vijay, you can get started. I think to me, as you rightly pointed out, India versus Australia or Australia v India is a very interesting rivalry because both the countries don't know each other a lot. And uh, it's not like Australia and England where they have a cultural affinity and there's a lot of uh, exchanges uh, and there's a lot of lineage. India and Pakistan is very different because uh, India, we share a border and we fought wars. It's more of a cultural, socio-political rivalry. Or if you talk about some of the great um, footballing rivalries, they're mostly the derbies like the Milan derby or the Barcelona Real Madrid. Or You have these things where fans want to hate each other uh, because it's tribal and uh, there's a lot of political undertones and all those things. Or even the American, once you look at it, uh, when Babe Ruth was sold, the Yankees versus Red Sox, the, the legendary rivalry was born. So in India, Australia, there was no rivalry. To begin with, since this context is all, all about uh, World Cups, when these two teams played in 1983, uh, Australia was pretty much driven by a lot of uh, factions and uh, they were not a united team. And India were ranked outside. So they were two, pretty much a middle table team and a, a minnow playing. But India went on to win a World Cup, so we can't go and write back uh, revisionist history. I think it all started to me in 1987 because preceding that Reliance World Cup in 1987, Australia came to India and played the Test Match Series and the famous Thai Test Match. And there was a one-day series uh, following that. So a lot of people outside didn't know a lot about that particular Australian team because it was a very young Australian team. But in India, the Indian fans who had watched Australia on TV knew about it. So when the Reliance Cup started with the first game, um, uh, in uh, Madras, uh, the first ever one-day game to be played at the MH Damaram Stadium. That game, the fact that they changed the scores in the middle, India lost by one run, and then Australia went on to win. I think probably that started a bit of it. And as you pointed out, Magesh, till 92 or 96, there was some rivalry because the games were still closer. But after that, Australia completely took off. But what had happened, the Indian fascination with Australian cricket had well and truly begun because... Australia became the benchmark and a gold standard for tests and one days. And we wanted to ape them for their quality of the cricket, coaching, uh, their support staff, the style of play, even their sledging, their mannerisms, the McGrath head shake or the way Vaughan does it. Color TVs had exploded. The commercialization of Indian cricket, as well as the, the eyeballs and the power of Indian cricket economy took off. And Australia was right because West Indies were on the down uh, or one on the way out which means Australia started to travel more to India, which means it became a better commercial rivalry. We started to see each other more. And results may not matter, but India and Australia needed each other as economic partners. And they played some great cricket, of course, when you have um, Vaughan, McGrath, uh, Sachin Tendulkar. 
uh, and Steve Waugh, you wouldn't argue against quality of the cricket. So it's an interesting rivalry. It began with a modest start, but it expanded into some close games. But more importantly, it is the commercial nature of the game. Because I'm not talking about the 2001 uh, Test Series. I mean, those were really, really great legendary things. Because it's one-day cricket, I'm going to stick to the commercialization of the nature of the rivalry between India and Australia. Excellent. And and that's a point that I want to kind of expand a little bit. Uh, that when the rivalry was reasonably modest in, in scale and, and commercial uh, scope, so to say, it seemed to be a lot more even contest, at least in terms of the results. You could argue 96 could have gone both ways. Like post-96, it's uh, it's a clearly uh, one-sided except for the 2011 anomaly. So as Indian economy or Indian cricket economy got richer and, and bigger, it's also, like you say, it coincided with the rise and rise of Australian cricket. And as much as uh, India managed to uh, compete with them during their absolute juggernaut days in test cricket, Somehow, even during that time, they, they couldn't quite live up to them in, in the one-day uh, scheme of things. Uh, but it's a theme we'll explore as we go along. Uh, in the meanwhile, let me, uh, let me get uh, Aftab here to, to weigh in on the rivalry and, and what a sense, his sense of this rivalry is. Aftab, can you take it ahead? Yeah, thanks, Mahesh. I, I agree with a lot, what, lot of what Vijay said. I think you have to differentiate between rivalry and competitive intensity and competitiveness. And I think uh, the media tends to conflate the two um, and sometimes, you know, uh, ends up creating a rivalry where one doesn't really exist. So I think India, Australia and natural sporting context they don't really have a natural rivalry the way India, Pakistan does or England, Australia do. But I think when you talk about competitiveness, you know, that's been there and it's been there through through multiple stages of their encounters in the one day domain, particularly when you center around the World Cup. So if you look at 83, you know, the teams kind of split the results. 87 was the, the games were really competitive and mid 80s was a point of time when when Australia was, you know, recovering, as Vijay said, through a young team and India was was a bit of an uh, ODI powerhouse in, in around 86, 87. And, and till about the 90s, you know, it was it was very competitive. And you know, when this whole media cricket boom happened in India and in, starting in the early 2000s after, you know, the, the turning point of the 2001 test series is when a lot of people started taking interest, um, driven by that whole 2001 series that, you know, we've defeated the world champions, we've defeated Australia. So it created an expectation that India would be competitive. And that's when the Australian team really notched up their game. And it was the ponting Steve Boy era where Australia were literally untouchable in, in ODIs. And you know, we'll, we'll kind of explore that. But it's very useful to see head-to-head -head stats between India and Australia in ODIs. And you can kind of almost uh, define those eras by the different captains. And the Ganguly era is actually the worst, where our win-loss ratio is, is the most horrible. We, Australia were literally untouchable. But there was this big expectation because this media boom had happened and cricket was like really com getting commercialized in India that, that we had to compete and defeat the best in the world. But purely from a rivalry perspective, I think it's a little bit overblown. Um, and I think the, the monkey gate kind of fed into some of the media histrics, histrionics uh, as well. But competitive intensity, I think, barring that period in 2003 and 2007, the teams didn't play each other. But I think the results probably would have been the same as 2003. If you look at the rest of the World Cups, um, it has been competitive, which has kind of evoked a lot of fan interest uh, and kept Indian hopes alive, you know, even even though the overall ODI record has never really been in India's favor. Yeah, that's true. So to, to extend on that topic, so what, for instance, like it's a very important point that we make that India-Australia rivalry is primarily a cricket rivalry. In fact, Australia's understanding of India and vice versa is so piss poor beyond uh, cricket. And whatever little we have seen uh, in, in the recent years is also built pretty much on cricket, apart from the migrant community, which has always been vibrant in, in Australia. But the mainstream understanding of the society's uh, view of each other uh, has been primarily built on cricket. And it's something that, uh, that Rahul Bhattacharya touches upon in, in a brilliant essay in, uh, in a book that Chris Ryan compiled, Australia, the Cricket Country. Uh, I think the essay is called A Billion Bill Lorries, where he talks about how India or a certain generation of Indian view, fans viewed Australia. And it reaches a point just in that Sydney test in 2008 when goes haywire and, and nobody seems to understand what each other is talking, right? 
I mean, even recently, I was listening to uh, Ricky Ponting on Sky Sports podcast, and he's he's saying I wouldn't do one thing differently than what I did in the Sydney Test. And you have Kumble who's who's still sticking to his stance that only one team played in the spirit of cricket. So that's probably the the point where the truth came to the surface that we just knew each other through cricket and nothing else. And and it's a different set of values as well, right? Because um, if you if you think about this is a piece that was written um, in Cricket Info, I think it's probably Jared Kimber who wrote about you know the whole culture in. Australian cricket and how great cricket kind of feeds into you know the behavior that you were seeing in the national team's uh, attitude and 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 what all led to Sandpaper Gate. And as an Indian cricket fan, you know if you've grown up in India and if you've even played reasonable level of cricket in India at, at a lower level, it, it, you find it very hard or difficult to relate to it. I've actually since I've been living in Australia for the last year or so, um, there's a small uh, cricket oval close to where I live, and sometimes on Saturdays I would just go out and watch great cricket during the summer season and. From outside, it looks really calm, and you know it, it is intense. People are people are like you know um, playing cricket in a very formal way, but but it's it was very difficult even as a spectator for me to relate to what Jared was saying in in terms of you know the abuse that's going on or you know the the intensity that's there or the kind of things that are being said because it's people of different age groups, and I think that's that's kind of the disconnect that that's happened between Indian and in in and Australian cricket fans, right? Because for for the Aussies, it's very hard to understand the the whole deification that happens of stars and the fact that the Indians were around monkey gate, not at all willing to even consider that anybody from their side could have done anything wrong. It's, it's a, it's an interesting dif- cultural difference. Um, and it's something that as a, as a migrant that I had also kind of experienced when I came here because cricket was kind of my icebreaker for conversations. And you'd very soon realize that you don't really go too far unless you've run into a hardcore Aussie cricket fan. And I haven't run into too many. So you kind of have to start pivoting and start talking about other things because their frame to, to the outside world is much much more than just cricket, whereas I think the, you know, as just as a cricket dominant country, we, we kind of tend to really narrow down on that. Yeah, I think it's a very good point uh, raised by Aftar because I've been living in Australia for 10 years. Growing up in India, especially with the cable TV arrival, uh, especially in those early 90s, the image that we got about Australia was very different, right? Funny lands, great TV coverage, and as you said, Bill Laurie's uh, hysterics or uh, hyperbole about, you know, comments and stuff. But if you really look at it, you come and live in Australia, you kind of realize Australia has got two important traits, which you don't understand watching through the cricket team. There's something called a, a tall poppy syndrome, as well as uh, barking for the underdogs. These are the two traits mm-hmm. that define the Australian identity or the DNA. So technically speaking, Australian people go for the underdogs and they never allow the snooty or the precious behavior to get through. And that's why the private schools are... Uh, scorn that. I mean, it's a very different culture, but when you see the cricket teams, you think they sledge, they talk. You kind of assume that Australia Australia is a very arrogant country, but it's a very yeah. opposite. It's the opposite of that. Yeah. When you come and live here, when you go to work, especially someone like me who came here 10 years ago, having worked in the US, Canada, and UK, people give me a lot of respect for my global experience because most of the Australians had not worked outside. So it's a very interesting country from that perspective. And a very important that uh, uh, Aftab talked about the oval where he watched cricket and Jared Kimber and other stuff. When you go to the league level cricket, there's a fair bit of abuse. But when you talk about abuse, this ne- never is personal, but the, the self-deprecating sense of humor is quite amazing in the yeah, way yeah. they talk about things. Uh, it's, it's not a British thing, but Australians have kind of uh, uh, customized it to their own ways. But the important thing, they all talk, but at the end of the day, they can share a beer. I think this is something the Indian teams of the 90s couldn't adjust to. Because if you look at the 80s, when Ravi Shastri, Kapil Dev, Sunil Gavaskar, and those people played against Alan Border and Co., they used to go for beers, and even after a win or a loss. But that stopped after the 90s. I mean, the cultural thing during the Monkey Gate, what we realized was the teams had stopped interacting with each other. They wouldn't go to the dressing rooms. They wouldn't socialize. They just went on with their ways, which means... There was very limited understanding of both the cultures between the players. And then we're talking about fans who are separated by 10,000 miles. They don't travel each other, I mean, to the, the each other's countries that often. So that creates all kinds of things. And Australians look at India as oh, this new rich kid who's trying to dictate terms without having the cricketing background or pedigree. Well, Indians look at Australians as arrogant. I think the truth lies somewhere in between. That's where we had this uh, sorry state of affairs of monkey gate or such and like it, whatever you want to call it. Which is why that that Kohli comment, and I'm I'm digressing a little bit here, but I do want to want to make this point. That Kohli comment that he made after that Ranchi test, that I have no friends in that Australian dressing room, was very very disappointing for me because 
for two particular reasons. One, with the IPL and everybody kind of playing in, you know, in this global league and sharing dressing rooms, you would have thought that a lot of that ice would have been broken, that you start getting a little bit of cultural understanding uh, about each other. And two, Kohli is, is someone who's almost a youth icon in India today, right? So what Kohli reflects is kind of the thinking that will that, that will then get reflected off an Indian fan. You know, and, and if the captain of an Indian cricket team is saying, I can't be friends with, with you know, Australians outside uh, of the field, I don't consider them as friends. It just defines an attitude for an Indian fan, um, and and I can relate to it because when I was a teenager, you know, you kind of had this image of Australia sledging and being very aggressive, and you thought the average Aussie was arrogant and boorish, but it's totally different when you actually meet someone in person. And to Vijay's point, it's a meritocracy, and over the course of the summer when India was touring here, I was amazed by the number of people, you know, who who were in awe of Kohli, literally in awe of Kohli, because the sentiment was you get Kohli out, you, that's the only way you can win against India. And by the time the series ended, you know, they were just going around saying, where is our Pujara? Where is our Pujara? Why can't Khawaja bat like Pujara? Or why can't somebody else bat like Pujara? It's it's, it's disappointing when when even in this day and age, you know, you kind of still see those those that that, that misunderstanding that happens at the, at the level of the players. That's where it shouldn't happen uh, because the fans are not touching each other so you can understand you know the 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 emotional boundaries or, or the sentiments that that can be divergent yeah, that's a great point actually especially i mean especially for a player who's uh, as uh, cosmopolitan as he is and with the, the kind of exposure that he has and the kind of stature that he enjoys i, th- I think he's cool. turned around uh, turned around a little bit though because i saw a statement from him a couple of days ago where he said uh, you know he was talking about warner and smith coming back and he said you know i know david uh, pretty well and um, he'll do well and i know steve also and people shouldn't be so harsh on him so i'm glad he's come around a little bit uh, but but uh, you know it's like when kohli talks india listen let's uh, let's just focus a little bit more on the on the matches uh, i'll probably split it up pre 92 and post 92 because 92 onwards i think all three of us have watched the matches live and and uh, we lived through those times 87 of course vijay lived through that time so let's talk a little bit about 83 and 87 and and vijay's insights on 87 will be particularly valuable uh, how how do you like do, do you have any sense of how it was perceived what it meant to meant to India the cricket country? Yeah, again, I was six years old uh, when the eighty three happened, so I had not watched them. Uh, but when the eighty seven World Cup happened in India, there was a lot of preview and there were a lot of uh, highlights packages from the eighty three. So especially India's game uh, at the Essex County Ground, uh, Chelmsford. I think mean, I think that was played out a lot. Uh, Roger Binney and uh, Madan Lal taking those four wickets. I think I still remember the number one hundred and twenty nine. Australia got bowled out, but but after you read a lot about that, you kind of realize that was a World Cup where Australia was in the team because Kim Hughes was a captain. There was a lot of uh, factions. So they were not there uh, to even compete as one team. But for India, it was very important because Australia was still a very powerful nation and India had not taken one day cricket seriously because if you look at it, India would play one day cricket only when they played a test series or a World Cup and especially 75 and 79, we didn't do much. So it doesn't matter how much we talk about the importance of the win, the victory over the West Indies at the Old Trafford in that uh, group game, the Chelmsford win, especially after the thumping we got at uh, Trentbridge after uh, Trevor Chapel 100 was an important win because to me, that win allowed India to get through to the semi-finals. And uh, then we went on to beat England and uh, and the West Indies in the final. So in the greater context, with a bit of, or with a lot of hindsight, that victory at the Essex County ground has to be rated as an important win for India, Australia, one day cricket. Because to beat Australia hands down, with a, with a not a very quick, but a, a seeming uh, attack of Roger Bini and Madan Lal, has to be categorized as uh, one of the, a top-notch performances. So to me, that 83 was pivotal. That victory over Australia was pivotal in cementing India's credentials in that World Cup from a 66-1 rank outsiders to go on to win a World Cup. Was that almost a knockout game? If Australia won, would they have gone into the yeah, same? Yeah, it was. It was. Yes. I mean, it was a right. knockout game, right? Yeah. Yes. And that's why I'm saying that the, it, it was not a win, right? I wish the teams of the late 90s and the early noughties uh, could have replicated that kind of win. That was a thumping win. But again, the more you look at it, that was against a very, very divided Australian team. It doesn't matter, right? Because when India lost the 2004 Test Series in India, India was a divided house. No one talks about it. So yeah. why should we talk about uh, factions? You know, a win is a win, and that will happen in England uh, in a summer when the ball moved around a fair bit. So to me, that was a very decisive moment for Indian cricket from a one-day perspective, vis-a-vis rivalry uh, with Australia. And also, even with the divided Australia, they still thumped us in the first match. The first game... Uh... Uh, there's a gentleman called Ken McClay. He actually ended up taking six wickets, six for 39. L- looking through the scorecard, just got a little curious and I was trying to kind of, you know, dig a little bit more about this this person. Um, 
So he was actually born in Somerset in the UK, ended up going to uh, relocating to Western Australia, played for, played for Western Australia. And that's the highlight of his career. He played like 16 one-day games, a couple of seasons of World Series cricket when they got him in. Eventually, they shunned him out after 87. Took 15 wickets. Out of his 15 career wickets, six came in that game against India. And if you see the highlights, it's almost like um, an older version of how Mohit Sharma was. Like this very straight action. You know, the body doesn't deviate at all and just lands it on the off stump and moves a centimeter to the left, inch to the right. And most of the Indian batsmen are, you know, either bowled through the gate or, or LBW, but defeated by that that minor movement. Uh, but very interesting. Um, you know, that that's one performance that um, gets buried under that travel chapter 100. He was a good swing bowler. He was a good swing bowler. I think uh, that was the main thing. I think he's, he's had a reasonable shield yeah. record, but again, as you, you're right, internationally, International not many level, know, yeah. unless uh, you had followed Australian shield cricket a lot. I'm very curious to hear Vijay's thoughts actually on that 83 team, Vijay, because you, you obviously saw a lot of the highlights as well. And my perspective on that 83 team is it's it's before the time when Indian cricket had really big superstars. Sunny was a superstar, but he had a horrible World Cup. I was looking at the batting order in that second game. Kirmani batted at number 10. So India batted deep, much like England batted deep in this World Cup. But it's a very bitsy and pieces team, if you see the kind of people who made contributions, right? In that second game, Yashpal Sharma scored about a 40, Sandeep Patel made runs, Binny made runs, Kapil made some. And it's almost like what we used to call New Zealand in the 90s and the and the early 80s. And after 83, of course, you know, Kapil became this big superstar and then you started having more and the profile of Indian one-day team changed as well. It's good that you brought up the discussion about 1992 because a lot of people talk about the 1992 New Zealand, but the Indian 1983 blueprint was very similar to the New Zealand 92 blueprint because because Madan Lal and Bini, Roger Bini, to be very honest, they were military medium pace, but both could bat. I think that's a big thing. Mm-hmm. And as you rightly pointed out, Keith Azad, a lot of people forget Keith Azad's contribution. He was a very good lower order batsman or even a middle order batsman who could bowl off speed. He bowled really well in that semi final as well yeah. um, against England. And then we had dashes like Sandeep Patil, of course, Mohinder Ramanath was there. So, yes, Sunil Gavaskar didn't do much, but don't forget Krishna Maja Srikant played a very good hand in the finals, playing some very good horizontal back shots as well. We had a lot of all-rounders. The only thing that was missing was genuine pace. In 1983, the pitchers, even the final, if you look at it, uh, it wasn't on a flat track. So, wickets were helpful. So, India utilized those conditions perfectly well. And we had the right pace to sort of the kiss the surface kind of bowlers, yeah. as they call it in England. You don't have to hit the deck. So yeah. they can get whatever movement and they were like day games. So they got the maximum out of the pitches and the atmospheric conditions. I had to be careful in saying atmospheric conditions because the moment you bring the cloud and the swing, there will be a few people who will be up in arms and saying that scientifically someone has proven somewhere that clouds don't play a part. But even if you had watched yesterday's game, it was a cloudy day at Trent yeah. Bridge and the ball did a fair bit. Just to, just to finish on 83, Mahesh, you know, you, you talked about how people remember India West Indies and the semi final and the final. Interestingly, actually, when I was very young, I think I was about eight or nine and I'd started watching uh, cricket with my grandfather and he had a very good friend of his also an elderly gentleman who would kind of sit with him and watch and somehow the discussion came around to Roger Binney and so in my mind that that Binney spell of that those four wickets that he took is always there since the early age because that gentleman started talking about oh Roger Binney used to be this great baller and in that game against Australia he took four wickets and that was the match winning spell he was man of the match so th- that that game and that Binney spell um, it, it, it kind of got imprinted into my mind at a very young age um, and have never been able to see anything on, on YouTube as to how that went. And I think it's, um, to quote one of Sidby's earlier articles, it's, it's probably one memory. I don't want to really, you know, go back and actually see what happened on, on YouTube, lest I be disappointed. So I let the legend linger on. Uh, moving on to the 87 World Cup. Vijay, you can take over the stage completely. Okay, 1987, I think that was, as I said, the tie test match. And we had a fair bit of familiarity with the Australian players. The first ever one-day cricket uh, game to be played at the MH Damaram Stadium in Madras. It was a Sunday. A lot of expectations. India's first game in the World Cup, though, although at Pakistan had started their first game in Hyderabad since. It was massive expectations. It was a brilliant game. Boone and Marsh and Jones and others. I think the most important thing, I think a lot of people think about the fact that the two runs that were added, the six that was not to be, it went through Ravi Shastri's uh, hands and uh, the umpire thought it was a six, but Ravi Shastri signaled as four. Then there are quite a few conflicting theories. Did the Australians talk to the umpires? Did the umpire make a change? Did they go to the Indian dressing room? Did couple make a change? I mean, we can rest those series. I mean, those theories can rest aside. I think the most important thing is two runs were added 
from 268 to 270 during the lunch break. When Australia left the field, it was 268. Just to intervene, Vijay, one second there. I read a vision report which said that couple during lunch break uh, kind of came back and said, you can consider that a six or something like that. Uh, yes, I mean, vision report says that, but there are quite a few people who say otherwise as well, right? Because R. Okay. Mohan, R. Mohan has written very clearly saying that for the journalists, it was very clear it was there. But the Australians went to the umpires and umpires made a change. And, and the wisdom report, as you rightly said, it, they said Kapil Dev uh, was magnanimous in accepting to those two runs. But it was a very rare occasion where two runs were added. So it, it was a big talking point. But India started off well, chasing, you know, 271 to win. Because the way Sunil Gavaskar, Shrikant and Navjot Singh uh, Sidhu played, we thought we were going to win. But uh, one of the great spells of Craig McDermott, people tend to forget, uh, he bowled a lot of cutters, he bowled a lot of slow balls, uh, the Steve Waugh effect was there. In the end, it was very, I mean, I think the reason why that game was great was because it was very similar, the Ravi Shastri's and the Maninda Singh's. Not long ago, on another Sunday during a, a tight test match, famous tight test match, we had seen the same protagonist being played out in, in front of the, the audience uh, between the same two teams. And again, a few months later, at the same ground. So that was a bit of a rival that was fledgling. Unfortunately, India ended up on the wrong side of the result by losing by one run. Next day, it was, I remember in the Hindu newspaper in, in, in Tamil Nadu in India, that was a front page. Was it a six or a four? So it was cricket. It very rarely does, very rarely did cricket uh, uh, move to the front pages in India. It used to be on the back pages, but that day it was on the front page because it was a controversy. So to me, if there was any rivalry between India and Australia from a World Cup perspective, uh, those seeds were uh, sown on that day because it went to the front pages. And um, Australia had a great start and uh, they went on to win the World Cup. India, after struggling with the first game, we were struggling in New Zealand, the second game in Bangalore. Then Kapil Dev and Kiran Mori got us out of the ruck. And we went on to win five games, including the, the return game or the revenge game against Australia in New Delhi. To me, that was a great game because we had celebrated the Indian festival of Diwali the day before. It was the Diwali day in New Delhi because the North and South Parts of India celebrate Diwali on two different dates. So it was a Diwali day, absolute mayhem. The firecrackers uh, were there, but it was more from the Indian batsmen. We scored a lot of runs. And uh, Azhar not only contributed with the, the bat, he went on to take wickets, including the brilliant cotton ball, which, uh, which is still etched in memory. So to me, the Indian batting guns boomed on the Diwali day in New Delhi, Ferocia Kotla. And we kind of avenged whatever happened in Madras during the first game. So by then, India were the favourites, uh, building nicely towards the semi-finals. And Australians were there or thereabouts because it was a sort of an easier pool, but Australians were winning against New Zealand. But they went on to win that uh, uh, very, very famous semi-final uh, uh, at the Gaddafi Stadium, which I've talked about in the other podcast. To me, one of the greatest upsets in the, the World Cricket, uh, World Cup cricket history. They went on to win. Unfortunately, we lost out at the Wankhede Stadium. So to me, to summarise, the 87 World Cup uh, rivalry was brilliant because the game was nicely set up in Madras. It had a lot of uh, intricacies, but we got a revenge in uh, New Delhi, so it was kind of 1-1. But in the end, one would say that Australia won the end because they went on to win the, the World Cup uh, at the Eden Garden. Let's move on to the 92 World Cup, which I guess all of us have seen and which is quite a thrilling match. Aftab, why don't you talk about it? Do you have very fond uh, memories of that match? Yeah, I so I was nine years old, um, and '92 is kind of my first uh, World Cup on television. And obviously, you know that entire nostalgia about cricket from Australia. You know, coloured clothing, day-night games, this wonderful bat, sound of ball on bat, which I think that that was the most distinctive thing for me. You know, the stump microphone and the stump cam, and I never knew that the ball could make this wonderful sound when when it was crunched. You know, on on the on the bat, and that was the most distinctive thing about cricket from Australia. At that point of time, you know, I, there wasn't a lot of hope uh, that India would do well in that World Cup. Uh, we had gone into that 91, 92 tour. And I remember, um, you know, I I was still young and didn't really have a lot of opinions of myself, but I was hearing, um, you know, my grandfather kind of talk a lot about the prospects of the Indian team. I was going to Australia. Um, I would go to my dad's office um, and, and, you know, his colleagues would kind of talk about what was happening and they all had their radio transistors on throughout that period. And it was almost you were hoping against hope that India would do well in that World Cup. We had been pummeled by Australia um, in the, in that 91-92 tour. Um, you know, didn't win a Test match. Only won that one game against Australia in in Bakka when Shastri took five for 15. So, so there wasn't a lot of hope. Um, but I remember the game because um, for you know primarily because there's this catch that Ajay Jadeja 
takes uh, when he's kind of running in from, I think, the long off boundary borders hit one in the air. It was a last over. And guys, now that, you know, we are in this era of hyperbole, can we call it the greatest catch ever in India-Australia World Cup matches? You know, since Ben Stokes now claimed the greatest catch ever in ODI history. So I like to label that as the greatest catch ever in India-Australia World Cup matches. And it was fascinating to me because I remember I saw it with, with a few of my cousins and we were just astounded that an Indian fielder could run and dive and take a catch, right? At that In that age, it was just, you know, that was a revelation for us that, oh, somebody from India could feel so well. Um, but I remember that. And uh, I think the other thing, obviously, is when when India were chasing, um, you know, Azhar playing that, that, that wonderful knock, he had a horrible tour, other than that 100 that he made in that Adelaide test. Uh, you know, this is probably his most standout knock from that period. He played, I think, another good knock against South Africa later on in the World Cup. But again, it's it's uh, all of my memories of Azhar's best innings are in losing causes. Um, so this one, the one against South Africa, then he played another one in Eden Gardens. Um, it was it was it was a very good knock. He played some very good shots. Like if I remember, like you know, just hitting a straight six of you know either it was Tom Moody or McDermott, where he just literally stands and hits it over long off um, for a six and. And I genuinely thought we had won the game when Kiran Mori hit those two fours in in the, in that last over. But you know, then he got out, and I was like, "Oh my God, here we here we go again." It's it's, it's symptomatic of that uh, '90s period of India where you know you were so near and yet so far. And interestingly, um, Sanjay Manjrekar played a good knock in that game as well, if I'm not wrong. Made with a strike rate of over 100, which is again a rarity for, for someone like Manjrekar. And if you look to 96, he kind of had an exactly same kind of an innings, just that he took longer. So he kind of again made, you know, he probably made a 50 in that, in that 96 game. Yeah. yeah. And just like uh, Azhar, I think the Sachin who made a 90 in that, in that match. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the 96 game, when we, when we come to it, you know, obviously yeah. I, I was yeah. much, much more aware at that point of time and watching, but 92 was just, you know, it was like just another, disappointment in that long process that had started since India started touring in, in December of 91. Yeah, in terms of 92, I think it was very interesting because as uh, Aftar pointed out, Australia had dominated India all through that summer, uh, throughout the summer, uh, four and a half months we were there. Uh, and by then, Australia had established themselves uh, as the best one-day team in the world because they went to the Caribbean in 91, 92, prior to that summer. And Alan Border, who wasn't a great test match captain, but was a brilliant one-day captain, they won that uh, one-day series 4-1 and that uh, in the Caribbean uh, against Vivian Richards' team. So that established them as the best. And they were great to watch, sliding fielding, relay throws, and they had brought in innovations with the, some baseball coaches and stuff in terms of the fielding. But interestingly, Alan Border being the uh, eternal negative glass half-empty person, before the start of the World Cup, interestingly, he started to talk up his op- opposition. Oh, New Zealand, there'll be 30,000 people at Eden Park. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for us. Uh, South Africa, they're an unknown entity at ASCG. And somehow uh, a very confident team because border being border being slightly negative, they went into the negative mode and they lost the first two games. And suddenly they were facing India uh, at the Gabba. This was a Sunday game, I remember. Australia had lost the first two games. India had lost the first game quite closely to the, to the English at the WACA by nine or ten runs, nine runs, if I'm right. And then that uh, famous game at the Mackay in uh, northern Queensland never took place. So India had just one point going to that game. So it was a must win. From an Australian perspective, suddenly their confidence is low. And pretty much there's a lot of pressure for Australia to perform on that day to prove a point. So I think they, they brought in Mark Taylor. And I, I fully remember watching the game. And a lot of people talk about the semi final being where the rain rules. Uh, were, became problematic. But in this game, uh, after when India was chasing, uh, the rains came down and they reduced by four overs. Indian targets went up. I mean, a lot of people don't talk about it because that's a very, very important thing we need to think through. And also, as Aftab talked about, Azhar played a blinder of an innings because a lot of people associate Azhar with the finesse and, you know, the revolving door and all the, uh, all the very nice... Uh, what do we say, elegant shots. But in this innings, he played some yeah. crunching shots. Yeah. I still yeah. remember after a rain break when it came, he'll hit a boundary, which was a crashing you know, shot. And Richie Benner would say, that's the start in his own Richie's ways. As, I mean, as Aftab said, he played some shots uh, to long on and uh, long off. And Sanjay Manjareka played a brilliant innings. But unfortunately, he was run out. Again, the lack of fitness. In those days, India yeah. wasn't a very yeah. fit team. And that, in this day and age, they, they would have easily got two runs out of it. But Sanjay Manjareka was a slow runner. He got run out. But for me, one abiding memory of the game was the Coca-Cola sign. Because 
Kiran More hit those first two boundaries of Tom Moody. Very interestingly, McDermott had bowled only nine overs. Border had that extra over for him, but somehow he bowled him in the 49th, and Moody bowled the last over when India needed 13 to win. And More would hit those two sweep shots, and both of them would go and hit the Coca-Cola boundary. I mean, we would have watched it 100 times on repeat. So I still remember the Coca-Cola signs where the two boundaries went, and unfortunately, that he would try the uh, shot third time, and the stumps would be broken into two. And then to me, I could still never ever forget uh, Javagal Srinath and Venkat Padiraju. They could have still gone for those runs. And the street smartness was never Srinath's forte. Srinath, to me, he's a cricketer with a lot of talent. He was a cricketer with a great talent. But he never had the common sense or the uh, street smart. They should have run hard. Raju and Srinath made an absolute hash of it despite Steve Ward dropping the catch. Exactly. To me, that was a, a missed opportunity. Had India won the game, who knows? They could have picked, the, picked up sure. the momentum and would have gone to beat Pakistan and uh, would have gone on to the semifinals, maybe. But that allowed Australia to have a bit of a revival. So... India competed well in the game, but unfortunately, the lack of professionalism and a little bit of lacking the street smartness was the reason why we lost the game by one round. Yeah, two more points on the 92 game. I think Manjikar actually talks about it in his book that it's on that Australia tour that he actually discovered, you know, the value of fitness. And he used to always overrate himself as being fit, but he got run out so many times on that tour that he realized it was lack of fitness that was contributing to it. Uh, and obviously, because you have to run so much on long Australian grounds, you just hit the ball for four, you have to run. Uh, and then the other one that I that I remember was, um, you know, and, and I caught it, didn't catch it when I was watching it, but I caught it when I was uh, watching the highlights. The six that Dean Jones hits with Srinath over long on, and Tony Gregg is on commentary, and you know he, he he's trying to say, oh, and he's hit it into the 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 Queensland, and then he suddenly can't realize what he is talking about in the waka and all, and then then he goes, well, whatever it is. <laughs> and then you know once he's kind of calmed himself down, he says, oh, it's the Queensland Cricket Members Association stand. That's where he's hit the ball. <laughs> This is is really is a typical Tony Gregg. Like, just got totally carried away with that when that when that six was. It was a beautiful shot, though. Excellent. I guess uh, let's uh, there. Let's move on to the '96 game, which I guess uh, it's funny when I think about it. Uh, even recently, there was some Twitter conversation in which one of uh, the guys came and said, uh, if Marqua had not resorted to bowling off spin and had stuck to his medium pace, Sachin wouldn't have got out and and India would have gone on to win the match or whatever. I can see the the joy of doing that counterfactual thing. I mean, what sounds funny to me now when I look back at it is is the fact that it was a fairly irrelevant match, right? I mean, yeah. in the context of the format, in the context of the World Cup. Uh, anyway, most likely these teams would have gone on to the quarterfinals. At least Australia forfeited a match, so there was something at stake for them. India didn't even have to do that. Uh, but it still resonates for a long time, at least for fans of the generation. Uh, and it hurts a lot, right? I mean, Sachin played a blinder, an absolute yeah. blinder. If you ask me, it's probably one of his finest uh, counter-attacking knocks in one-day cricket. Yeah. Uh, it was a, it was a precursor to Desert Storm, in my mind. Like what he did two years later. This was like, it, it, this showed what was about to come. And and uh, there's something about Desert Storm or that period of Sachin where everything looked inevitable. But this was a little more like, it could happen, may not happen. But on, on the days that it happens, you, you, just, you just feel blessed that it happened right in front of your eyes. Did this loss hurt you a lot? Uh, I mean, I remember being hurt a lot. I, it, it was painful for a long, long time. It didn't hurt me a lot. Um, so that's a contrarian take. I think um, in the 96 World Cup, the one that really shattered me was a group game against Sri Lanka. Because that match, I thought like India is just going to win. There's no way, you know, we would. Were you, were you there at the ground? No, I wasn't there at the ground. Uh, I remember it was a weekend game. It was a Saturday, uh, and I saw it. And till till the time Sri Lanka started batting, like I was like literally gung ho. And Dukas scored a great hundred. And once Jay Surya tore into Prabhakar, I kind of like you know it was it, you never expected that from Sri Lanka. You know that that was the, it was just a bit of a shock. You know, even though I'd, I'd seen the, some of their results in Australia and all, but the intensity and the ferocity of that assault was was what like literally numbed me as as an Indian fan. I think the Australia game, I you you kind of always felt that India in the 90s, you know, chasing under lights with all the pressure, it would have been a great result had we won. Um, but it wasn't as if we were expected, or, or at least as a fan, I didn't expect that, oh, we'd win this very easily. And then we lost. I, I, I really enjoyed the Tindulkar rings. I remember I was watching it with my mom and dad on TV and I was literally just in that fan superstition mode, not moving from my chair even, you know, a centimeter lest he get out. And one of the things I remember was India started really slowly. I think in the first seven or eight overs, like our run rate was like just about two and over. And then suddenly in one McGraw over, he just exploded. 
you know, and he kind of hit him for like two or three boundaries, hit that great six over mid wicket. And then we sc- scored like 50 or 60 runs in about six or seven overs. And Azhar got out and Azhar had made like 10 or 11 and Tendulkar Rally really made a 50. And by the time Sachin got out, he had made 90, but India just made 140. So we were still like 100 away from, from the target. Um, and, you know, the moment he got out, uh, you know, it, it, as a fan, I kind of knew that this is it, you know, uh, too many times in, in the 1990s when, you know, we had a, India needed to get batting second six or seven runs and over and you were pinning your hopes on the likes of uh, Mongia, Kumble, Srinath and, you know, whoever was batting after them and you knew that was not going to happen. So to me, it was a, a very significant match for something else. This I spoke to Sidvi on the other article when he wrote for the 1999 uh, test match uh, at the uh, India-Pakistan test match from Chennai. Uh, because, you see, the important thing for India from that game or for Australia, who is going to be the the leader of the pool because we wanted to play the quarterfinal in India. You don't want to go to Pakistan and play. So India wanted to control certain things so that we play either in uh, Bangalore or in uh, Chennai, the two quarterfinal venues in India. You don't want to go and play across the border. So it had a lot of significance in terms of topping the pool and Sri Lanka having got those uh, four points uh, because Australia and West Indies didn't travel to Sri Lanka. That put some added pressure. But Australia were the favourites because they had a more balanced side. I mean, if you look at the 1996 side, because Azhar had announced his uh, divorce just before the start of the tournament. It was a very, what do we say, very divided uh, training camp in Bangalore where people felt Azhar was never there. So it, it wasn't a, a very fine, uh, you know, well-knit Indian team. They had a lot of problems, but Sachin Tendulkar was there. At his, to me, what really stuck out was not the Mark War 100 or the uh, Mark Taylor, the way he yeah. played the horizontal bat shots. But it happened in between innings. I mean, they... In between innings, they were showing Sachin Tendulkar practicing. And the, the net boys were throwing, they were throwdowns and Sachin was hitting the ball. And Ian Chappell was watching it. And the crowds, the way they were chanting, I think that was probably the first game where the Sachin, Sachin chant became institutionalized or nationalized in India because it is one kere. It doesn't matter where else they chant. When they do it at the one kere, it, there's a bit of an extra bit of warmth. There's extra bit of our Sachin versus the rest of India's Sachin are you know, our guy, Bombay, South Bombay kind of a feeling. So the, the such and such and chant was resonating. It was almost as if the whole stadium was expecting him to uh, bring in a miracle for India against Australia. And then, as Aftar pointed out, we had a bad start, a Fleming bowled a couple of peaks of deliveries. And then Sachin started to, uh, you know, attack Glenn McGrath and Fleming as well. And again, the noise levels, I mean, even David Shepard uh, talked about it later because that's the first ever day-night game at the Wankhede and uh, and even people felt there was a bit of a buzz, the electricity around the ground in terms of the atmosphere and the chant of Sachin, Sachin and Sachin was blazing and again we talked about the commercial nature, forget the, na- uh, the game and the result, the fact that Shane Warne was bowling for the first time in India yeah. and Glenn McGraw was there, lights and Sachin Tendulkar at his absolute best this was made for TV. This was made for commercial India-Australia rivalry. So to me, that was the game that nailed the India-Australia rivalries for years and decades to come. And we all saw it. And that was a brilliant, brutal innings. Unfortunately, as you said, Mark Waugh came and bowled a wide and uh, took such an internal crowd. And the rest of the Indian uh, batting wasn't good enough to cope up with the Australian, the wily attack. So to me, very important, brilliant game. The two things. The Sachin Sachin chant, which almost became institutionalized and it, became, it ended in 2013 at the 1K day, that became famous that day. And also the fact that Sachin Tendulkar put a stamp on the Indo Australia commercial cricketing rivalry under lights, and that took off and that never uh, turned back or, or looked back ever since then. Yes, so with that, we move on to the 1999 World Cup. Uh, and as Vijay pointed out, if, if 96 was the pinnacle of that rivalry in terms of explosive commercialization and uh, and the TV eyeballs that it generated. Uh, 99 onwards, at least the, the 96 seems to be the, the defining point of uh, the India-Australia World Cup rivalry from where on. Australia just ran away with it in a way. Uh, and 99 kind of epitomizes that more than any other tournament because you could argue that 2003 was absolute, you know, uh, best of the Australian one-day cricket. But 99, they were a little suspect coming into the Super 6 match. And this was the first Super 6 match India had its own drama coming into it, uh, but Sachin was back and, and they managed to win against England and they came on a relative high, so to speak. Uh, so you would think that this match had 
had fairly even odds going into it. Maybe Australia marginal favourites, but they came and absolutely thumped India. Uh, so, what, what are your thoughts on this match, Vijay? So, I, I think it was a very interesting tournament because, again, uh, the 99 tournament, India were considered one of the rank outsiders. We were forced to play on county grounds, not at test grounds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there were favourites like uh, Australia, um, South Africa and Pakistan were the more favoured nations. You're right. The, the, the India had the distraction of losing to Zimbabwe and Sachin was away for his father's funeral and then he came back. I think the England game was very important because uh, the game at Edgepeston where it was the next day when we went on to win uh, with Debashish Mohanty bowling really well. So we thought the Indian team was picking up and was peaking, um, peaking at the right time towards the Super 6. But unfortunately, from an, Aust- from an Indian perspective, Australia were building up nicely as well after a very slow start in cold May conditions. I think the game, the last game they played was against West Indies at Old Trafford where uh, McGrath got out Lara cheaply and uh, he just made absolutely sure uh, the Australian juggernaut started to slowly move on. So the fear all was always there when we got to Oval because we didn't carry any points. Australia didn't carry any points. It was almost like an absolute slugfest. And, uh, and Steve, I still remember Steve were talking about because this was the year after the desert storm. He said, hopefully in these conditions, Sachin will nick one early from McGrath. And, you know, I, I don't have any... Brazil. There's no love lost between me and Steve Waugh uh, as a person, as a captain. And he made the statement that exactly happened. And unfortunately for me, what I remember the most was India was a little deflated going to the game. Because after the high of England, when we... And again, it was one of those curious moments when Azhar won the toss and inserted opposition in. In, in hindsight, he should have never done that uh, for the Super 6 game. And the Indian body language wasn't there. I mean, I think Vankadesh Prasad was a bit all over the place. Srinath bowled well. Um, and uh, Devashish Mohanty was there or thereabout. And Mark Kuo was really, really, you know, professionally played a very good innings. And in, Australians didn't contribute a lot, but they played the conditions very well and they got 282. And once you get 282 on board in a slightly English condition, and you have Glenn McGrath, you have got a problem. And to me, the interesting point, I still believe, Sachin Tendulkar made a technical error. I think he was trying to play McGrath off the front foot. And uh, to me, in those conditions, he should have been slightly different. With Ajay Jadeja and Robin Singh, did a little different. I think Rahul Dravid and Sachin Tendulkar were sucked into those uh, balls that should have never played. An unfortunate thing, but again, you have to give credit to McGrath, and he was a great bowler. And as Steve really pointed out, uh, I think Indian party was always in the few overs. Then, though there was a great partnership between Jadeja and Robin Singh, India was never in the game. And you never felt from the first ball India was there or thereabouts. The body language wasn't there. Uh, the, I think the commitment wasn't there as it should have been. But unfortunately, again, as I said, Australia were a great side and they, were, uh, they had the momentum um, coming into the game and uh, they were almost unstoppable. Uh, that went on all the way to the Lords. Uh, I remember reading uh, something about uh, some sort of a conflict between Sachin and Azhar on, on what to do on winning the toss. Uh, apparently, Sachin wanted to bat first and Azhar ended up uh, uh, bowling first. And, and Azhar, it was a pre- primarily a defensive move, right? To protect our batting against Megra and, and company. One, it was, I mean, it was the highest score to chase in England at that time. So, naturally, India felt a little, a little deflated when they, they started the chase. The other point I wanted to kind of talk about this match particularly is the fact that uh, it is very likely, especially given uh, the, the white Dukes ball that they used in that World Cup tournament, uh, which swung around quite a bit. And Adam Dale was the one uh, who opened the bowling for Australia when the tournament started. And Megra was bowling first change. If they actually had a pretty good uh, you know, group stage and Adam Dale was uh, you know, doing the job as well as he did, let's say, down under a little while earlier... It's very likely that Megra may not have even got the new ball in this match. True. And also, the other important thing what you need to talk about is Sachin opened, the, opened for India in the first South African game. Then he went for the father's funeral. When he came back, he was batting at number four against Sri Lanka, against England. He was batting in the middle order. Then he was reinstated to open against Australia. So I think there was even a discussion at that time. I think Sachin wanted to open. Yep. Sachin Tendulkar wanted to open. And I believe, I'm not very sure, Azhar might have had a slightly different idea about it. Because Sachin's view is, you play Australia, you can't play from the back foot. You need to be on the front foot attacking them. So, again, one could say that there was a bit of a, you know, he opened, he went back to India and then came back. Uh, he got about 100 at uh, Bristol and then uh, he had, uh, I think, a low score against Sri Lanka. But against England, he played all right. So, 
he wasn't in the greatest frame of mind because of the personal tragedy and, um, and stuff. But McGrath was at his absolute best on that day. He literally spoiled the Indian party. So the toss, um, look, I think Azhar, Azhar's view is, see, there are two ways, right? Test match cricket, you could play a session out and then you can, you can expect the conditions to get better. But you don't want to lose this couple of early wickets. So in, in many ways, inserting an opposition can be a, an attack, attacking move in one day cricket. But you're right. Back then, chasing was always a problem. And 280 was never going to be chased down in England in 50 overs. That was the difficult thing against a quality attack. There's a, there's a very famous book by uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez that's called Chronicle of a Death Foretold. And I think you can apply that title to a description of <laughs> the, moment, the moment I heard India's bowling uh, I was like, here we go. And the funny thing is, despite the evidence of this game, right, on a, on a slightly slice, spicy pitch, you want to pr- protect your batsman and insert the opposition in and you, the script basically turns out, you know, the opposition gets a big score and, and, and you can't chase it. Ganguly did the exact same thing in 2003. And his reason was the same. The, you know, the pitch was too spicy. We didn't want to expose our batsmen to McGraw and all. And it's almost like, you know, <laughs> you had... The, you Actually, had that's a good thing. good segue to move on to 2003 and especially that match. Uh, and I have this... Uh, I'm not a particularly big fan of Ganguly as a captain and uh, and I'm very much in the... Oh, in the right. uh, you're, you're, camp. Inviting, you're inviting Twitter wars on yourself when you say that, mate. <laughs> it's okay. I think that Twitter was, uh, war is comfortably won. I mean, there are still some jerks who are, uh, who are going on. But... Uh, uh, I mean, I have a slight, uh, I mean, I want to make a distinction here because uh, when Ganguly made that call, I would give him some benefit of doubt because Indian uh, seamers were bowling quite beautifully throughout the tournament. Yeah. So you could see it as an aggressive strategy from the perspective that he bagged his bowlers to do well. But Azhar didn't have that sort of uh, a performance to go into this match. Uh, yeah, let's talk. For, I mean, it's, it's a good uh, good segue to talk about the 2003 match. Uh, I, I guess we'll talk a little more about the final than the first disastrous match that happened. Sorry, Mahesh. I think we need to talk about the first disaster match as well because to me that's very important. The game was played at the Centurion Ground, and mm-hmm. we were beaten badly because Gillespie bowled absolutely oh immaculately. My God. Amazing. Spell. And Sachin, Sachin played. I mean, a lot of people miss out this. Sachin played one of those. Beautiful cameos of 36 before he was uh, hoodwinked by a very good slow ball from Gillespie got LBW, if I'm right. Um, So we lost the game. But I think the important thing of that game is not the result. And when in those days, Ravi Shastri was a proper commentator before he became an IPL stooge. So he was literally scathing about the Indian performance, spineless. He was using all kinds of words. And then that set off a lot of things back in India. People were pelting stones. Mohammed Kaif's house was attacked. You know, car windshields were broken. So literally, effigies were burned. Literally as if the whole nation was up in arms against the cricketers because the, what happened in New Zealand prior to that on some of the spicy pitches where we lost the test cricket and one-day cricket. And this, was continu- this continued in South Africa with a, with a poor, poor show despite a win against Netherlands. And then this Australian loss completely made India a laughing stock. And people started to say, hang on, why are we in competing? And so the reaction back home and the backlash, and then we went to Harare and Sachin Tendulkar's famous speech saying someone has to take the bull by its horns, and he led from the front. So to me, the revival of Indian cricket, despite Sachin making 36, that revival after that uh, sequence of wins that we produced, including that of Pakistan, before we went to the semifinals, very important. So to me, from an Indo-Australian cricketing perspective, the fact that you lose a cricket game and people's cricket players, their homes can be vandalized and cars can be attacked for a game of cricket needs to be told to the audience because that's the importance some of the Indians give to cricket from a socio-economic perspective. I think that a socio-political perspective, I need to say. Also from the perspective of uh, Australia's great start, I mean, let's not forget that they had a horrendous start to the World Cup, right? Like Shane Vaughan, Vaughan, Vaughan getting banned. was out and Gillespie bowls so beautifully, probably the ball of the tournament with, uh, to, to Sachin. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, he's off uh, packing pretty soon as well. Uh, and yet, uh, we, they had this tremendous run. If, if at all, you have to call the peak of Australian one-day success, it's probably started from here on. Yeah. Although they were successful before this as well. Yeah. yeah to, from that perspective, this is a significant match. Uh, but, but when people look back at 2003, you're really talking about the final, right? Look, I think we need to talk about the preview. I mean, I, I like to give a bit of a story about 2003 because I was in India uh, till that India-Pakistan game. I was, uh, I, I, my, I was planning... Well, I had my tickets booked to travel to the U.S. that night. 
But I wouldn't leave till Sachin got out to that bouncer from Shoaib Akhtar. So literally watched the end of the game from the airport, got off at the Singapore uh, terminal and, uh, you know, read the newspaper. So I was in the U.S. in California for the Super Sixers and the semifinals and the finals. So it was hard to watch because we didn't have the coverage. So we used to go to the movie halls and watch, you know, community places. So, so it was all building up in a very different way. But uh, with the way India was bouncing back uh, from that early uh, losses and the way we were building up. And for the first time, we had some two or three quick bowlers, right? Because we could dish out the way India destroyed New Zealand in the Super Six with Ashish Nehra and Zaheer Khan. Then Sri Lanka, like, you know, after we got the 290-odd, literally Srinath and uh, Zaheer were... We, we were bullying batting lineups, international batting lineups with our bowling, fast bowling. Compared to 83 or in those times when we had these good swing bowlers, first time we are bowling at 140. And Ashish Nehra's spell against England under lights uh, at King's Queen was great. So there was a bit of an expectation that for finally, for once, India can stand up to Australia and, uh, you know, take them on. And uh, Mahesh is right. That's one of the reasons why Sarah Ganguly thought that, okay, it was, a, I mean, don't forget, it was a morning, it was not a day-night game. It was, it was a Sunday morning, 9.30, 10 o'clock start. And it was high fell. So his view was, I had the bowling attack and I could knock the, the Haydens and the Gilchrist and Pontings and have them like, you know, three for 40. The game could be pretty much be over. And uh, why would I give that away to uh, Lee and McGrath? So to me, I remember watching the game from a Pakistani restaurant in California with full of Indian, uh, you know, friends. I made it very clear even back then that it was the right decision. You win the toss and you insert the opposition. 99 was incorrect in hindsight or even at that time. 2003, we had the ammunition to... Uh, do that. But unfortunately, Zahir and uh, Shrina didn't start well. But credit to Gilchrist and Hayden because that's the Australian nature. Right? They can intimidate, they could bully you, they could put you in your places. Right? They did that and India never recovered. And we were absolutely chasing leather that day. Harbhajan came and took a, a wicket or two. But Ponting, he played an absolutely magnificent innings. Hard to watch because of hurting. I still can't uh, move on from that uh, for many reasons. I'll make two more points on that 2003 final. So I have a contrarian take on the toss. I think also because there was an example where in that Pakistan game, Australia were actually two or three down fairly early. And then Pakistan had a pretty good bowling attack. You know, your Bakar was seen. Yeah, Akram like, gets three wickets up front, yeah. yeah. And then Simons comes and just blasts them off, right? So there was a lot of depth in that Australian batting lineup. And even if you could knock t- top two or three early, it didn't mean that you would bundle them out for 150. The only way in my mind back then to defeat Australia was you had to put scoreboard pressure on them. Moving on, let's talk about the, the 2011 World Cup, which uh, which is India's rare World Cup win against Australia in this uh, pretty much since 92, right? The last win was what? 87. 87. 87. So this is the solitary win from that 87 till till 2015. And, and it came uh, when the stakes were quite high. And I remember personally, I, was, I couldn't sleep through the night. I was so nervous because, uh, you know, just... Just that period I was talking about earlier, let's say between 2001 and seven, the Toshal in Juggernaut was just unbeatable, especially in one days. Um, I was just checking the checking the head-to-head record. We played 28 matches in those seven years. India won six and lost 19. So even when India went on this great run in one-day cricket under Dravid and Chapo, uh, we still couldn't really get on top of Australia. Although we were, we had the record for the most successful, successive run chases and stuff like that. Uh, so I was extremely nervous going into this match, uh, and even, and the the one thing that struck me now when I think about it is that for a big match when Australia didn't particularly lose a lot of wickets, they ended up scoring 260, which is which is kind of weird. But of course, it is a little bit of slow, uh, sticky wicket at Ahmedabad. Uh, but I mean, considering both the matches in '87, for instance, were were about higher scores than this, so it sounds a little funny for me when I look back at it now. And that's not going to happen, right? You're not going to have future World Cups where you look back at three World Cups before where the par scores were higher between these two teams. So that's a bit of a rarity. Uh, and Ponting, of course, played a good knock, but Yuvraj kind of came and sealed it. So for me, in that World Cup, this was my favorite match. Uh, although Pakistan was quite dramatic with Sachin being dropped so many times. But this was my favorite match of the World Cup. Uh, talk us through this match. What did you think of it, uh, Aftab? How, how, did you, how did you experience this match? 
Yeah, so I remember, um, you know, watching this for, for most of the duration. I think I was um, I was at home, um, saw this game quite a bit. And, and you, I've said it now, you know, a few times in the pod, right? You can imagine like Australia batting first. And I was like, oh my God, you know, here we go again, do we? Um, but you kind of got the sense almost from the beginning that either they were holding back or they were just not able to force the pace. Um, and even the Ponting batted really well. And I think it's one of his one of his better knocks just because he was at the, you know, his career was kind of coming towards towards the end. He wasn't the Ponting of 2003. So he wasn't as dominant, but he stuck it out. There was a lot of perseverance in the way he approached the innings. And he kind of realized that his staying on for long would have would, would end up the team um, having a good score. But you kind of almost sensed that, you know, India were able to control them, not really let them get away. And, you know, Yuvraj uh, took a couple of wickets in the middle. And then there's one point when they actually start to try and do a little bit of acceleration is I think when they started losing wickets. And I still remember that slower ball, that's a heel ball to Mike Hussey. You know, clip, you completely missed it. He was trying to, you know, come out at him, give him the charge, you know, hit the, hit the off stump. And from that moment onwards, I think Australia just didn't get that final kicking gear towards the end. And in the chase, uh, you know, contrary to some of my previous India-Australia experiences, I was pretty confident, actually, uh, of, of India's chances. Um, I thought we had a very deep batting lineup. Uh, we had Raina coming in in that game, batting at seven. So that's the composition change that Dhoni had done and took out Yusuf Patan, got Raina in. So the batting was a little bit stronger and deeper. Um, and even when, you know, I think when there was a little bit of a wobble and Dhoni got out for a low score, he's probably the only one who didn't hit uh, double digits in that scorecard. I was reasonably confident India would India would do it. I think Yuvraj played very well, had, had great composure. Um, but again, there's this image in my mind, uh, I think towards the end when there's, there's this cover drive that he hits and Lee's diving on the boundary and the ball hits him on the face and you know, kind of then leaves the boundary with you know, blood tear coming down from, from a small cut he has. Just personified, you know, the the attitude of of the Aussies um, of, and that time and that team that, you know, they were, they knew they had a legacy to live up to. And they weren't giving it up and, and they were just putting everything in it. And it, it kind of also told you that you really had to be on the top of your game all the time if you if you wanted to beat Australia. And I think once that obstacle was over, uh, even though the Pakistan game was very tense just because the state's in it, I, I pretty much had a lot of confidence in, in India going all the way. Yeah, I think this game, I think it has to be the most underrated games in the Indo-Australian rivalry because a lot of people don't talk about it. As Magesh said, Australia, despite losing the 96th final, they had won three tournaments on the trot, 99, 2003, and 7. And uh, they were on the way up again to the quarterfinals. But the important thing is they had lost the Ashes at home for the first time in many, many years uh, to England. And uh, they weren't the most confident side. Uh, There were like some divisions. Uh, I think that there was a, the team was in transition and Ponting was leading. The intimidation that we used to see from the Hayden and Gilchrist wasn't there. I think that's a big thing. And also, again, everyone knows I'm no big fan of Mahendra Singh Dhoni or his captaincy, especially in test matches. But you have to give credit to Mahendra Singh Dhoni. He copied the 1996 Sri Lankan or the 90 Sri Lankan experiment of choking a team by spin. And he took it to the next level. Because if you see, India opened the game with Ashwin. We had the bowling like Yuvraj. See, even, even if you look at Ravindra Jadeja, right, just pretty much a copycat of what San, Sanat Jayasuri was. You bowl very quickly, don't give any time. And, you know, use the defensive tactics on slow pitches against spinners. And use it as your strength. It's, it's kind of a negative, negative captaincy, but that works well in these kind of conditions. So Dhoni became an absolute master of that. So to Mahesh, to your point, again, this is before the power play rule changes and the two balls and all. So you could, the ball used to get dirty and... It could be harder to score in those days. So 260 on a slow, slightly uneven surface uh, at Matera and Ahmedabad uh, was a reasonable score. But I, I talked a bit about Sachin Tendulkar in 2003, but here he started off really well. I think a lot of people give credit to Yuvraj. That's fine. But to me, Sachin Tendulkar was a standard. He played Lee and Tate really, really well and set up India very nicely. Of course, Suresh Raina and Yuvraj Singh finished it off. And if I'm right, Sachin got out to one of the very few balls that moved away from Sean Tate uh, for a 50-odd, 50, 50, 57 or 53. I don't know the exact number. 53. 53. So uh, this was a game that has to be uh, in the Indo-Australian um, annals of the game, has to be given a lot higher uh, a position, especially from an Indian point of view, because we knocked out the defending champions from a, uh, from a, a knockout game. 
Uh, I think probably the fact that the game was played in Ahmedabad, not at Devonkhet or Eden Gardens, that didn't help to give the history uh, or the pedigree. But it was a great game. And as, as uh, uh, Aftab rightly pointed out, the, the bleeding Ian, uh, not Ian, uh, Brett Lee, uh, with, with a bit of a bandana on his head to cover that uh, was a sight to behold at the end. And Suresh Rana and Yuvraj finished it off. And, uh, and then kind of one kind of knew that once you beat Australia, it was going to be very difficult to stop uh, uh, India to all the way to win at the Wankhede because we had New Zealand, Sri Lanka and Pakistan. And by then India had a very established team uh, with a very good uh, spin attack for those conditions. And uh, we went on to win the tournament. It was a typical, uh, you know, the conditions in the, in, the, in, the, in the World Cup was made for the Dhoni brand of captaincy, right? You kind of have a lot of, uh, you know, dibbly dobbly kind of ballers, spinners who can come in. And if you just look at the scorecard, right? Uh, like Munaf Patel balled seven overs. And I, at that point of time, you would probably say Munaf Patel is closer in, in his average speeds to, you know, what Yuvraj was darting through rather than what Zaheer was. But, you know, you, Yuvraj balled a full quota of 10. Tindulkar balled two. Kohli balled an over. You know, I'm surprised Raina didn't ball. But you're right, Vijay. Ashwin opened. Um, so it was, it was just ideally, you know, set up for, for Dhoni to, you know, just control the game uh, with his, you know, spinners and, you know, control the middle overs and then keep teams under leash. I mean, for me, this was uh, this was almost like a World Cup win. I, I don't know. My stakes in the next two matches were a lot lower than this. Uh, having been through that, uh, that great Aussie domination uh, phase, this came as a much needed relief. Of course, India had a, f- a fine run coming into that match, but it was still a fairly, uh, I mean, if anything, I, w- I went into it thinking that Australia would be the favourites, uh, given their uh, their record in knockouts in World Cup and, and just the overall quality of the one-day team. Uh, and, and they used to play pretty well in India because they came for a one-day series in 2007, which they, I think they won 4-2. And then they came back in 2009, and again they won 4-2. So even in in that Dhoni era where you know you mentally you start thinking that oh India started winning more and started becoming much more competitive, the win loss ratio was still one in three for India against against Australia. That was the one team that we just couldn't shake off uh, and, and get a good record against. Yep. Uh, so that leaves us with the final match uh, in the rivalry, which was in 2015. Uh, I have uh, I can't say fond memories of this, uh, but I do have some good memories of this because I, I, there was a match I watched at the SCG. And that is probably the first time where I thought I could understand what's going on in Smith's batting, right? He had this phenomenal summer against India where he was uh, scoring runs for breakfast, uh, brunch and everything. Like, I mean, he, was, he had a feast against India. And and it was very hard for I mean he was not a very he's not a very conventional batsman he's he's more like a Chandapal but at least we saw the whole organic changes uh, over time of Chandapal but uh, it's like the late stage Chandapal turning right-handed and batting all of a sudden and becoming this batting genius so it was very very hard to decipher what he was doing so for me uh, at least the the live experience of watching him at the ground was was uh, was particularly enjoyable uh, although it came against India but. The fact that he played a fairly flawless inning, scoring at above 100 strike rate so comfortably with hardly taking any risk was just was just fascinating to watch. Yeah, he he never looked in trouble throughout that innings. I remember watching that game. Um, I was in the US um, business school at that point of time, so you know odd hours. Saw it. Saw the first innings with a few friends, and then we kind of you know everybody dispersed back to their own rooms because it was late night, and we thought we'll you know just watch it by ourselves. And the moment he started batting. You know, this, it it was it was effortless, and you and you never really felt you could get him out unless and until you know he played like a big slog and you know you know kind of just gave his wicket away. Um, but, but he was, he, he, you're right, Mahesh. He was in the middle of a wonderful summer, especially against India. Um, and I don't think the Indian bowlers had really kind of figured out how to bowl to him or what you know what were the ways to restrict his scoring or you know even how to get him out. I think uh, we were just hoping that he makes a mistake and we get his wicket early. Yeah. So again, uh, to, I mean, 2011, I was in Australia watching it on TV. 2015, the semi-final, I was there at the ground. Uh, had a great view from the Victor Trump stand. Uh, look, I think this game was very important for a couple of things because during the quarterfinals, uh, at the end of the quarterfinal uh, against Pakistan, Steve Smith, David Bonner, and all of them had literally called out for more fans to come to the grounds because there was a fear going into the semi-final, thinking Indian fans would outnumber the Australian fans at the SCG for the semi-finals. That was a real fear. But at the end, it was 50-50. Um, it was 50-50 because uh, there were a lot of Indians. 
uh, but the Australians were in equal numbers, uh, wearing their yellow colour. So that was, you know, you don't want to have a, a home semi-final where the, the, the opponents outnumber your home fans. And uh, as Mahesh said, uh, we took David Warner out early. There were mass celebrations. But before that, I would like to talk about the anthems. To me, uh, the only thing India won was the anthems because the Indian anthem was such a spine-tingling I would say it was such a passionate anthem rendition by Indian fans. And the Australian one is almost like the Brazil-Germany um, semi-final from the 2014 World Cup. The only thing that Brazil won was the, the anthem and Germany won the game 7-1. So you could feel it at the ground. But after that, once Smith and uh, um, Finch started to put the partnership on, I mean, there were a lot of people who started to say, hang on, are we in the game? What is the target score? I think I thought we were going to still get up, uh, restrict them to 300. But then Johnson came Johnson and played, came uh, yeah. you know, yeah. hit those big fours and sixes and then literally killed us. I mean, Faulkner played well. So the moment he was 328, uh, uh, you know, it was going to be hard. But there was hope. Uh, when Rohit Sharma and Shekhar Dhawan, I think the Indian fans who were literally uh, uh, under the cosh from the Australians, those 12 overs when India scored those 70 odd runs, the SCG was literally an Indian cricket ground. The fans were out in numbers celebrating and Shikhar Dhawan played some scorching boundaries. Yeah. But everyone knew that uh, it was never going to last once Faulkner took him out uh, by the catch around the uh, third man, close to the point, a deep point, I would say, because I was seated over here and I watched it quite well. So a lot of fans left early and the Australians started to mock us at the ground because I was there to lay until the presentation. But, you know, where are the Indians now kind of stuff. The other interesting part was uh, the chance, right? Again, this is one thing, having lived in Australia for 10 years, having gone to a lot of test cricket and one-day cricket, one thing the Australians can't do is sing. English are brilliant in singing songs and stuff. <laughs> but it was the Indians who were singing, like the Jiteha, Jiteha India, then this India, India, India song. So the, some of the Australians were, you know, asking us what we were singing and stuff and trying to understand that, oh, okay, some of you don't even speak the same language because I speak Tamil and a lot of them were speaking Hindi and Punjabi. So they were kind of, you know, the Australian fans, it was pretty bemusing for them to know that people from the same country couldn't even speak the same language. But they kind of started to pick some of these uh, things around the songs and the chants and the, the group clappings and stuff. So it was a good experience. I mean, it was an absolute thumping defeat. Again, it puts Mike Mahendra Singh Dhoni's captaincy in perspective as well, right? Four years ago in Ahmedabad, he had the conditions in his favor. He had a bowling attack, but here he had to have Mohit Sharma, Mohammed Shami and Umesh Yadav. The moment you give paces and, uh, and, and on a good SCG wicket, his captaincy wasn't effective, but on a, a turf like the Ahmedabad in 2011, tailor-made for Indian type of spinners and his type of captaincy, he was absolutely unstoppable. Yeah. Interesting point about that game. You you mentioned the first 12-13 uh, overs. Which, uh, India was 76 for no loss after 13 overs. That's when Dhawan gets out. And it's the same top three now that India are taking to 2019. Right? So it's Rohit, Dhawan, Kohli. Obviously, they've traveled a lot of distance in, in the last four years. And after Dhawan got out, India lost about four wickets for, for about 30 runs in, in about 10 overs. And you pretty much knew like the game was up then. Dhoni played like a fighting hand towards the end. But if you think, look at that batting lineup, right? Dhoni batted at six, Jadeja batted at seven, and that's it. Then you, then you have the ballers. And it's pretty much the same template that India have even now in England. So the, the concern that a lot of people raise that, you know, the batting kind of finishes after Pandya and then just falls off a cliff might well happen to India again in a knockout game in, in, in 2019 if you're chasing a big score, you know, and you have like Dhoni and then and, and Pandya and then there's literally nothing unless you play Bhuvi who can bat a little bit, you know, but if Bhuvi is not playing, then you have Chahil Yadav and, and Shami and Bumra and, you know, not a lot of confidence in those last four. Which is yeah, but I think, I think the only thing that India has improved uh, from 2015 to 19 is Indian bowling has got more teeth, especially in the middle overs as well as at the start and the death, which means... You would back India not to concede the 328s that they did four years ago at the SCG yeah. that often. I mean, of course, it can happen. I mean, what Pakistan did to India in the 2017 with Fakhar Zaman playing one of those unusual innings and then India fell to Mohammed Ami, that could still happen. Yeah. But one would hope that the bowling has come a long way in the four years um, and therefore uh, India would be able to contain the or restrict the opposition to uh, a lot lesser total for the batting to chase. Excellent. Uh, I think we've caught quite a lot of ground on the on the rivalry over the years. Uh, let's just close it off with uh, the prediction for the match on the on the ninth. I would say I think it's being played at the Oval. Um, Oval suits Australia quite well because uh, traditionally Oval has got uh, the maximum amount of bounce, except Old Trafford. Uh, it's a good track, 
and um, it's a bit of an unusual ground because one side it's a shorter boundary. Um, usually expect flat decks. It's a 10:30 morning start. I would back Australia to beat India at the Oval, um, unless it's an absolutely feather bed of a wicket. If the wicket has got something, and if it's a decent uh, English day. I would expect Australia to beat India in a close game. Yeah, I think in my mind, a lot would depend on how India play their first game against South Africa. They've got a tough uh, set of games when they open the World Cup. Um, you know, the, the games come a little, the tougher games come early for them. So if they've had a good game against South Africa, I think uh, they'll be a good in a good frame of mind. If Australia bat first, I think it's advantage Australia um, because they can run up a score, and you know, India would be would be heavily reliant on on the top three. Um, I would still though lean a little bit more towards India. I know Australia played well when they came uh, to India uh, a few months back, uh, but I still think it's a little untested um, in terms of what that batting combination looks like and how they're going to settle and then how well is, is Smith, are Smith and Warner playing. So marginal lean to India, uh, but I, I think it could go either way. It'll, it'll be fairly competitive um, in, in my mind. Should be a good game. Isn't that all what we want? We want another one-run margin victory, right? Uh, it's been great talking uh, in the Australia rivalry with, with uh, Aftab and uh, Vijay. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks a lot, Aftab and Vijay, for joining us. Thanks, Mahesh. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot, Mahesh. Uh, it was nice talking to you, Aftab. Thanks for listening to Everyone All Out Podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other similar podcast platforms. It would be wonderful if you could leave a rating and a review so that more people can find us. You can also follow us on Twitter at 81 All Out and check out all our previous podcasts and articles on our website, 81allout.com. We'd love to hear from you, so please keep the feedback coming. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. In the air, Srijan takes it! India wins! He'll come back for the second. India have won the test match. India have won the series. They're going to get back for two. India at home. Lords goes wide.